Welcome to On Cloud, the podcast for cloud professionals, where we break down the state of cloud computing today and how you can unleash the power of cloud for your enterprise. Now, here's your host, David Linthicum. Hey guys, welcome back to the On Cloud podcast. Today on the show, I'm joined by Anthony Lazaro. He's principal product manager at Twilio. How are you doing this morning, Anthony? Doing really well. Thanks for having me here. So how did you come to Twilio? And actually, I I think we talked about this during the pre-show that it's located in Charlotte, North Carolina, which is one of my favorite places in the entire world. Yeah. How did it become to pop up there? Yeah. So I'm actually remote over here. So Twilio is based in San Francisco, but we have people everywhere. We part of COVID, we've become a remote everywhere type company, which other people are probably considering as well. And how did I come here? So I've been on a product journey for a decade, working with technology companies. I started with a you know young startup, 27 employees, grew that to hundreds on the product side. I've been with a traditional enterprise, going through digital transformation, you know, running a team there, and then moved to Twilio, really passionate about providing infrastructure and APIs for the builders of the world. And really, my job right now is I run product for one of our uh, portfolio products. But my customers are these builders of cloud services trying to build product applications for their businesses, for their customers today. So can you go a little deeper in what Twilio does? I think uh, listeners heard of the name, may not know exactly what products or services you, you guys provide. Sure. So Twilio is a communication platform as a service. Historically, we kind of help people run voice applications or text message applications with a few API calls. And we provide you all the backend infrastructure and SDKs to do that. We have grown and now we actually have full-on applications from customer data platform to contact center solutions. So really we provide you programmable infrastructure to accomplish a lot of your customer digital journey experiences that you need to get done. And one of the things that uh, I love about this topic is I noticed this through my career as well. So in other words, I it kind of split the difference. I was a product CTO where I actually to build and deploy products into the marketplace. And those are the olden days we actually had to deliver things on uh, CD drives and DVD drives and then wrestled around with that and then kind of figured out the aspects of that, that there was a much more higher level of standard that had to occur and the higher level of quality, the ability to kind of repeat things over and over again, because you're building something that has to work on lots of different platforms, including platforms that you you didn't anticipate it working on. And obviously there's issues with going with that, you know, some of the quality issues that you deal with as a as a product, and then went into enterprise development where there's not as much rigor around that. So in other words, we're building applications for a known set of users. And I found that the development processes and even the uh, cultures within the two development communities communities was very different. So let's dive into, you know, what's good product development and, you know, ultimately why everybody is talking about this as a new paradigm these days for how we should build and deploy all systems. Yeah. So, you know, what you're calling out, the discipline of product has been around kind of forever. You know, you go back decades and hear Steve Jobs talk and it's talking about these product principles. But recently, especially over the last decade with the advancements of technology, the moving of everything into cloud, the accessibility of OpEx cloud services, you have this extremely fast pace of development where you are building in an enterprise and you might have hundreds of applications or even thousands of applications constantly building new ones. And the issue is that just because you build something doesn't mean it works or it actually is solving the problem. And so that's where the practice of product has come into play and it's become very vogue in terms of, you know, content being written and books being written about it. It's because in order to get the ROI out of your investments, you need really strong, sound, product principles and culture on your teams that are building. So in other words, the ability to kind of get more discipline, get more rigor, get more quality in how we're building systems. And so I I think if I'm understanding this correctly, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, we really should always be building things and managing projects as if we're building a product with the same sort of standards, same sort of culture, the same sort of discipline. So no matter if you're building you know, an accounting application for six people or a, uh, you know, API platform, you know, for 6 million people. Am I off base that way? Should they be two different cultures? Yes, you're you're spot on. You know, the way that we build, whether you're building actually the 
user interface or digital product for a consumer, or you're building platform capabilities for internal stakeholders, you need to be building with a product mindset. And it's going to ensure that you actually have more successful outcomes and innovation in what your technology can do. And the counter path is you're building technology and everyone's kind of frustrated with it. Yeah, and you're, you're competing against other applications and even products within, say, you know, say a cloud deployment. And so someone is using some sort of a custom application that's a legacy system that's been around for 20 years, say it's an inventory control, and they're using a SaaS-based CRM system. And people are noticing the difference between the quality and the, and the experience of using one, say the SaaS-based system, which was built from the ground up to be a product, and something that was not. And so... I think what you're getting at it is what I get. We're investing almost the same amount of money in building both those systems or leveraging both those systems. And why not do it in a way where it's going to be a product that's able to keep and provide the experiences that you need to make that more valuable in the enterprise? And I think that's what it comes down to. So it's not this good enough mentality. People say, well, it works. Yeah, yeah, it doesn't work. So, but the ability to kind of take it beyond that to get to an engineering standard that we're probably people who are building enterprise systems aren't quite used to. What do you think about that? I think that's spot on. And I, and I think it's coupled with what we see happening at a macro level too. You know, digital transformation has changed how businesses get done. You know, you're not walking into retail banks, you're opening up your phone. And there's all these backend processes and applications that need to be able to be cohesive for your business to actually operate in that new paradigm of how the business gets done. And the second big thing is our customer expectations are exceedingly high. And it requires organizations to really be able to have this high interoperability across all of their kind of application bases, their internal processes, to even things that go out to their customers. And without that, you're not going to be able to meet the expectations of your customers. And these are really being set by the digital giants. You know, you look at Amazon, you look at Apple, you look at these teams and they're setting a new standard for kind of how business gets done. And your customers don't care that you aren't Amazon or Apple. They're kind of expecting that same level of value and experience from your organization. So we're redefining customers as not just users, but people who consume the system. And I think that's kind of fundamental to what we're discussing here. So in other words, the expectations of a customer selling a product as a CTO back in the day, or a user, someone who's leveraging an application that I cobbled together and built to solve a distinct business issue, but it was good enough to solve it and then release going forward, really, we're kind of combining those as one and the same. So in other words, we're defining customers and users of having the same expectations, the same needs, looking for the same experiences. And really trying to get them to a very similar productivity level that we're not just kind of distinguishing between the uh, with the various customers and the users out there. So how do we get there? What, what's good product management, you know, for solving these tech problems, customer business? You know, what are the key values in terms of changing the culture? So we are treating customers and users the same and providing the opportunity for them to be as productive as they can with these systems. Sure. So, you know, a simplistic definition of, you know, product and product culture and management is, you know, using technology to solve customer problems in a way that benefits a business. And one of the leading thinkers here in this space is Marty Kagan. He talks about the four risks on product and product innovation. It's the risk of value, usability, feasibility, and viability. Meaning, is this valuable for my customers? Can my customers use it? Can I build this? Is it feasible? And is it going to actually work for my business? And you might think, oh, well, you know, all my engineering teams are, are following this definition. But to flush it out on where it breaks down, let's set up a, a dichotomy. So you have teams that are truly product teams. And then the opposite of this type of team is really what I would call a delivery team. And on a product team, you have teams that are working on problems, solving for outcomes. On a delivery team, you have teams that are given features and told to build them by a certain date. On a product team, they're very empowered to figure out how to solve those problems, meaning the solutions are getting pushed down to the teams that are building. And on a delivery team, the stakeholders are just saying exactly what you need to build. And what you have within these two groups is you have one that's highly collaborative, 
that is using the process to drive innovation, while the other one is really highly combative. Things are getting thrown over walls. Business stakeholders look at the engineers and think, why is this getting delayed? Why is the solution not good enough? And the engineers look at the business leaders and they're thinking, these people have no idea what they're talking about. <laughs> and so that's really the dichotomy of, I think, product development and the way the two different worlds that can be operated within. So I'm thinking about the CIOs and the CEOs that I know in this space. And I think one of the common complaints that I hear is that the technology within their organization is moving too slow and they're not necessarily getting the ROI back from developing this technology. So they're investing lots of money into this. And it looks like we're going to have to invest a little more to, to, to get to a more product development oriented culture. So what are some of the benefits you get back? So in other words, how would I sell this in the boardroom? And this is something that we need to do. Yeah, I, I think you're hitting on the foundational question. People are spending so much money, whether that be resources or OpEx on these cloud services, and they're not happy with the pace of innovation. The ability to respond to threats or the ability to capitalize on opportunity and one way that people think about solving this is they think about adding process. So they start getting more rigorous in their process. They hire project managers and have more oversight. They write more requirements. They more fully flush out user stories, et cetera. And the irony here is this process, you know, and I'm not opposed to process overall, but when we're adding on all of these layers of process, what happens is the developers start to get farther removed from the problem that they're actually working on. And they're just building solutions out of context from these problems. And that just exacerbates this negative cycle of our pace of innovation isn't good enough, projects are delayed, the solutions aren't actually solving, adding value or working for our business. And so the opposite of this is adopting the best practices of a good product culture, working on those four risks across product and engineering and design and being collaborative on how you build with a focus on problems that then is going to result in solutions that actually work. And so in terms of why it's needed, you're spending so much on building these you know, resources and technology, and you need to add in this place for collaboration. And there's some investment there in terms of building out product teams and how you structure stuff. But the ROI is just immensely, you know, proportionally higher. Yeah, and I, I, that's, what, that's what people are looking for. And if you think about it, you know, we're moving into the next generation of business where business is going to be defined by their innovation, their ability to kind of create, you know, net new value. So valuation is going to be on revenue somewhat, certainly on revenue growth. But if you look at the bigger players out there today, they're being rewarded in terms of value through their ability to become more innovative and provide more viable products that are entering into the market. So I mean, here's the $64,000 question. And you know, obviously, big consulting firm, we do delivery all the time. And then looking at you know, different kind of product-oriented development techniques and building a team. So how do I build a good product team? You know, what are the roles? What's the culture? How do I drive culture? What kind of you know, key people should I think about? You know, should I be hiring for this or do I build these people? Yeah, sure. So in terms of what a good product team looks like, you'll typically have three roles there. There's the product manager, there's the design lead, and there's the engineering lead. And this is a highly collaborative trio that's really helping you constantly devalue those four risks that I named earlier. If you're, if you're a back-end team, then maybe your design lead is more of an architect you know, while you're, if you're a front team, you're, you're obviously having heavy design input there. But that is the key dynamic is that you have this collaboration across these functions in how you build. And you're both discovering the problem together, as well as discovering and iterating on the solution together. And this is, again, juxtaposed to that idea where these are very separate functions and the business owners are really the stakeholders that are just throwing work to the engineers to build. And so that is, you know, the day-to-day -day work of a good product team is constantly having discovery and understanding of who your customer is, doing research on how your solution is really solving that problem. The, the second, you know, fundamental thing is having this high collaboration across these resources. And the third one is really having really healthy stakeholder 
cross understanding, which is really managed by the product manager. So you're constantly confirming this is viable for our business, the solution that we're building. And so those are kind of the fundamentals of a good team. And if I were to call out one thing that's the most important thing, in addition to what I just said, it is really engaging your team of engineers on the product vision. It's who is our customer? What is their problem? How do they use the solution? And how is this benefiting our business? And if you were to walk around to every engineering team member, you would hope that they could answer that question. And if they can answer that question, I bet you have a really high performing team. Right. And so that gets to the cultural changes that need to occur. And I think that would be probably, you know, more my concern if I'm kind of transforming the culture, which in many instances you are. I mean, you just brought it up earlier. And I think that's exactly what's going on right now is a lot of developers, software developers, system developers, you know, hide behind the processes or not hide behind, they're, they're removed from a lot of the interactions and dealing directly with customers and everybody's into what their job description is and, you know, and, and not necessarily being in a flat organization or, or into, you know, where their position is in the organization. I have 10 people reporting to me versus I have 10 people collaborating with me on a real-time basis. So is this a training exercise that we do? Or are we uh, just, is it a, a iteration and constant reinforcement of what a good culture is? Or are we uh, just, you know, hoping that people assimilate to the culture and get kind of get to understanding what the value is? So it, it's definitely something that needs to be intentionally enacted. If you have a quarterly meeting where you talk about your product vision, that's not going to do it. That's not good enough. You need to have, you know, a lot of teams are using agile. Maybe they're on two week sprints. Once a sprint, the PM should be setting aside a tiny amount of time. We're talking, you know, 20 minutes, 25 minutes to have a conversation with those developers on the team around our product vision. Hey, here's the problem that we're working on right now. Here's how it's working into our macro two-year vision for where we want to be. Here's how we're expecting customers to use it. And you're talking about what you're building. You're having these conversations. That is a cultural change. You can have process meeting. Oh, okay, we're going to add 20 minutes on our sprint planning meeting that helps you get there. But it is a cultural change where you're empowering and you're pushing down decisions to this team with product management, with engineering leadership, and you're really empowering these teams. That is, that is a cultural change that really starts at the top of stakeholders. You know, are, are you as the leader going to be dictating, here's the idea I need you to implement, or are you going to be handing your teams and creating your teams around problems? Hey, you know, this team, you're focused on this problem. I want you to work around solving this problem in this, you know, for this customer type. And you're really pushing down where the innovation is occurring. That, that, those are the keys to, to really a good cultural change around product. So how are traditional enterprises looking at this problem right now and adopting this as a best practice? Because I do see a big chasm kind of growing between companies like yourself that actually build products, cloud services build things that are more repeatable and going to be robust, robust and have better experiences in the marketplace versus enterprises that are just used to building good enough and doing so with some sort of a static process that they, they really kind of drive like a religion. So what should they be doing to get to the culture, get to the best practices, to get to these kind of dynamic teams that are able to provide product-based development quality? Yeah, I think there's a few things that traditional companies, enterprises are doing to adopt product-based practices. First is you kind of understand in your engineering organization, the different types of work that's getting done. Some of your teams are application teams. They're dealing with potentially end customers and they're needing to have extremely fast iteration and, and you know, solutions. Other teams are more platform teams where they are building capabilities to support these application teams. And, and the timeline is a bit longer in terms of expectations for both shipping new things and how long those things are going to be supported. And the third type of group is, you know, more enterprise teams. You're largely buying applications and administrating them and, and doing things like, you know, payroll. And, and that's a much more slower moving timeline for your, for your organization. So once you have these teams in place, you can start to think about how you need to staff them for product best practices. You know, for your application teams, you need full-on dedicated design, product, and engineering 
You might need multiple roles, you know, on your design side to really empower a team to move quickly. But that core unit really needs to be in place. And you need to be structuring them where they can focus on problems that they can iterate and work on very quickly. On the platform teams, you know, this is that internal team that's really key and a stakeholder. And for them, those customers are the application teams. You need to make sure that you're hiring in a good, strong product leader that's not just doing project project management for your platform teams, but it's really helping those platform teams build for the long-term vision and essentially really understanding the job to be done of their application teams. Because uh, what you'll find is, you know, sometimes those teams are very ticket-based, pumping out features, but the platform team really needs to understand what's the job my application teams are trying to do, and it's going to help them build in a way that they don't get pigeonholed you know, six months after deploying. And you know, on the enterprise teams, that's, that's a much more slower pace that can be controlled more through stronger product leadership at the top. So I think how you organize is a really key understanding of where you should focus on applying and staffing for product best practices. And it kind of really runs the spectrum of those three different types of teams. So the big question that I think the listeners are asking right now, coming from a cloud computing world, some of them doing product-based development on cloud-based systems, how do we get started? I mean, what are the things that we do to create a team, to empower a team, to sell to the stakeholders, you know, things like that? Say I'm in an organization, we're doing, you know, a fairly good job in dropping software at, uh, at good increments, things like that. And people seem to be mildly impressed with it. But really trying to take things to the next level, does there have to be a problem that we're solving or is this something where we're looking at opportunities to build something better than we're doing right now? Yeah. So, you know, what I would encourage are maybe two ways to get started. If you find yourself in that description of product versus delivery teams, heavily on the delivery spectrum of the world, I would look at one or maybe two teams, you know, a spot in your organization where you can try to operate as a product team, meaning give those teams a problem to solve, empower them to figure out how to solve it, and start with this baby step of having a small group really run as a product team in your org. The the second thing that I think could be done, and this is a really easy day-to-day change, is I would, and I mentioned this earlier, I would tweak how you scrum. Add in how you scrum, a time for developers to dive into a conversation around who their customer is and their problem. And if you have that ritual, once a sprint, where you're doing that, you're going to suddenly start to see developers innovate on new ideas of what you could do. And they're going to start doing their work where they have better vision for where we're going so they won't be pigeonholed on what they deploy. And you're going to start to see the fruit of just that little bit of effort around product. So we're in an elevator together. We're going up uh, six floors and I'm looking for an elevator pitch in terms of how you, you know, why you build a product-based development organization. So what would those reasons be? Just kind of real quick that people can summarize this so they can take it to their leadership. Sure. In business today, the biggest threat that you have is your inability to innovate. It is your inability to respond to threats or to capture and realize market opportunity. and While you might invest lots and lots of money in engineering resources, the key to success is actually using all of those resources appropriately. And that's done through healthy product best practices. That's a great way to end it. So where can we find more information about you and work you're doing at Twilio? Sure. You can reach out to me on LinkedIn, Anthony Lazaro, Principal Product Manager at Twilio. And go to Twilio.com, check out our different APIs and programmatic tools that you can use to build great customer experiences. Spell your last name for us, please. Lazaro is L-A-Z-A-R-O. So this is a great discussion. Anyway, if you enjoyed this podcast, make sure to like us, rate us, and subscribe. You can also check out our past episodes, including those hosted by my good friend Mike Cabas. Find out more at DeloitteCloudPodcast.com. All one word, if you'd like to contact me directly, you can email me at dlinthicum, L-I-N-T-H-I-C-U-M, at Deloitte.com. Until next time, best of luck on your cloud journey. Everybody stay safe. Be back real soon. Cheers. Thank you for listening to On Cloud for Cloud Professionals with David Linthicum. Connect with David on Twitter and LinkedIn. 
and visit the Deloitte on Cloud blog at Deloitte.com forward slash US forward slash Deloitte dash on dash cloud dash blog. Be sure to rate and review the show on your favorite podcast app. This podcast is produced by Deloitte. The views and opinions expressed by podcast speakers and guests are solely their own and do not reflect the opinions of Deloitte. This podcast provides general information only and is not intended to constitute advice or services of any kind. For additional information about Deloitte, go to Deloitte.com forward slash about.